Here we are on part 12 of Blood Vessels, um, somewhat beginning on page 739, but I'm going to go over to 737 for a moment and make some terse comments as um, uh, one of your colleagues. I am one of your colleagues. I'm a, I'm a student, even though I'm also a professor at M. I'm a lifelong student of everything anatomical and physiological. <clears throat> and um, I'm just sort of looking here at the venous system, um, the overall depictment of the venous system, and reminding you that um, some 60% of the blood is here. There's other things going on here that are unique. Um, one of the things that's going on with veins that is not going on with arteries is that they are quite variable in the skin region, um, particularly in the forearms, legs, and so on, that um, we can actually modify the amount of flesh actually in our arms and legs um, based on our activity and behavior, and that uh, there is going to be a venous supply that also uh, supports that change. In addition to that, arteries are tend to be somewhat, um, how would I say, commonly placed or uniformly placed, whereas the veins, especially in the skin, uh, can arise in very anomalous ways. If you are a already somebody who takes blood from patients, you will discover that going to their uh, antecubital veins um, in the anterior elbow can be quite a, how shall I say, hit and miss situation trying to figure out which one has, uh, is carrying the most blood. Okay, so um, uh, one difference between arteries and veins is veins are smooth and straight. Arteries are circuitous and, um, how would I say, not, they're always in the same place, but they are torturous in the sense that they wiggle back and forth along their pathways. Okay, you will not see that so much in the venous system. Um, another thing about the venous system is the entire skin supply. When you look at your skin, you're not looking at arteries, you're looking at veins. So when you see somebody who's well-developed in their arms or legs in some way, and sometimes they're lean, you're also noticing a venous development in their arms and legs and so on, and that um, you're noticing that the skin actually is uh, using blood in a very different way than the rest of the body, which is to uh, regulate temperature of the body. Another detail is in the digestive system, we use blood uh, filled with nutrients from the digestive system to then go to the liver. All right, so all of the uh, blood of the digestive system we're going to see here is going to bypass the usual trip back to the heart momentarily to go to the liver and then go to the inferior vena cava. So we'll be on the lookout for that. So I, I just want to sort of advise you that the venous system is a little different uh, because of the volume of the venous system and the nature of the venous system and the manner in which we uh, utilize it. So here we are on page, um, well let's go in fact even slower on page 738 over here is sort of a uh, schematic diagram that doesn't really look like the analog Okay, so what's going on right here, for instance, is we have a cavernous sinus. What's going on up here in this lighter blue color is we have a superior sagittal sinus. We have an inferior sagittal sinus. These are all structures inside the skull that we're going to be uh, visualizing over here. So that's going to be an interesting little sort of workup. Before we even go there, I want to take a very close look at the return to the heart. And I'd like to orient us to the superior vena cava, which is this unit. Um, it is fed by actually three blood vessels uh, as tributaries. There's two brachiocephalic veins, unlike the arterial system uh, that only has the one on the right side. Here on the venous system, we have two, a left and a right brachiocephalic. What you're not seeing here, which is also a tributary, is um, another um, another unit, let me just come over here for a second. Here we have the 
superior vena cava. And here we have an interesting unit that's coming from the back of the thorax called the azygos um, vein. Okay, so where is the azygos listed here? Here it is, the azygos vein. Okay, it's big. And it plays a role here with um, as a tributary. And also, it actually, there's lungs here, and it, there's an impression in the lungs for it. So we have one, two, three, one, two, the two brachiocephalic veins, and three, the um, azygous. One, two, three, tributaries for the um, superior vena cava. Doesn't that sound like a test question? That's because it's a test question, <laughs> both on the quizzes and on the um, lab practical. So just a heads up. Um, what are the three tributaries for the superior vena cava? Why, they're the left the left and the right brachycephalic and the azygous. Okay, we've gotten that out of the way now. Over here they show us again, here's the azygous, the left and the right brachycephalic, feeding the superior vena cava just the way you like it, a little one, two, three. I've even put the one, two, three in there. Okay, so now we can come finally over here and we can take a look at the exterior of the head. So there is a, um, how shall I say, sister vessels in the venous system that are sister to the arterial system. Um, things you're familiar with, like the um, superficial uh, temporal. We should be seeing, yes, superficial temporal. And then also there is a facial unit right there. There's facial. Okay, so facial is coming back this way. Superficial temporal is coming back this way, but then look out. Uh, <laughs> there is a strange thing going on here. This part of what you would think of as superficial temporal is now going to be called retromandibular. Uh, so I wrote it in here, retromandibular vein. And it's actually becoming retromandibular. It's going right behind the mandible. The facial also sort of tucks itself behind. And so it's also retromandibular. So all of this here is retromandibular, which then takes the blood from the superficial, uh, temporal, and the facial. It gathers that blood and takes it over to the uh, internal jugular right here. That's our internal jugular vein, just the way you like it right there. Okay, then you'll notice also there's an external jugular right there. And some of your friends who are particularly lean and maybe long-necked or something, I don't know, uh, you might detect a vertical, just as there is a diagonal sternocleidomastoid muscle coming down over the top of that diagonal muscle is a vertical um, vein. Sometimes uh, ballet dancers and um, runner-type athletes can demonstrate that for us very well. Okay, and then um, we have our um, vertebral vein. Now, what I'm not telling you in this picture is where are they going? What do they hook up to? Because now I'm going to come back to the schematic here for a minute, and I'm going to take a look here at their drawing. What they've done is they've placed a little dotted line here in the drawing here over the schematic, and it says this is the subclavian vein up to here. And then right here between the um, external jugular and the vertebral vein, we have that division. So you could think of that as sort of an NFL official ruling or something. But uh, at any rate, uh, the ruling has been made and that means that the vertebral artery, or vertebral vein, excuse me, is uh, emptying into and is a tributary of the uh, brachiocephalic vein. The internal jugular is also a tributary of the brachiocephalic vein. We have to use the word tributary. Okay, if this was arteries, we would be branching, but we're not arteries. We're coming this way back to the heart, and so we're creating... A, uh, a tributary type of dynamic, okay? So that's the way that's working. Um, so that pretty much tells us the story up there. Um, and then we're going to take a look inside the skull, and we'll pick that up right in our 
next section right here is coming up now.